Hoy vamos a entrevistar a Seth Cook. Él trabajó en TSR, TSR, la empresa que originalmente publicó Calabozos y Dragones, Dungeons and Dragons. Trabajó en el set Expert de las viejas ediciones de D&D. Después fue el diseñador líder de segunda edición de D&D, el creador del setting Planescape. Ahora volvió a ser publicado este setting y le vamos a hacer una pregunta difícil sobre ese tema. Trabajó en videojuegos, en varias cosas más. Vamos a comentarle sobre su vida, cómo era eh, trabajar con Gary Gygax, el creador de D&D, cómo era el ambiente laboral en TCR, que pasaban cosas rarísimas. Todo eso en esta entrevista que vas a ver ahora. Seb, uh, before we go to your work in the TTRPG industry, I mean, we have to ask, I know this question has been asked a lot of times, but... How did you uh, find out about Dungeons and Dragons for the first time? Uh, I mean, what year was it? Uh, when when did this happen? What were you doing? How how did you come upon this game that uh, changed your life, if I am allowed to say? No, oh, oh yeah, I, well, it, it did change my life. Yes, <laughs> um, I was in I was in college, uh, and this was around 1974, uh, seven, 74, 75, right around then. And I had always played uh, games and this, and at that point, if you're playing games and serious games, you were playing a lot of war games and this sort of stuff. Um, and so there was a war game club at college because, you know, you could go meet with people and they'd go, go to like the big uh, union hall and you know, set up games on tables and sit around and drink beer and and have a good time. And one day, uh, um, one of the one of the regular players that I knew uh, had been had been running some other game that I didn't really know much about. Didn't know, but but he he got to talking about it and said, "Hey, you know, this is a really great game." And you know, should kind of kind of explained the general principles of Dungeons and Dragons and. And so it was like, oh, okay, that sounds really interesting. I was a theater minor, so uh, you know, it sounded like I could do this. <laughs> and and so got invited to his game. And this was way back with the original little white box rule books and uh, just the three rule books. I don't even think uh, I don't even think Greyhawk had yet come out at that point. And. Um, And, and yeah, and we played and it, we, we just played really badly. It was great because you know, I had a dwarf. We went into a dungeon, stumbled around a bunch of us. We were at you know, a bunch of college kids with uh, you know, all sorts of different backgrounds. And uh, we, we fought things, died several times, uh, finally found, found the treasure. And, you know, he's using the rule books and, you know, you get this percent in layer thing. And so he's rolling up these six and it's this, we're like, you know, first, second, third level characters. And we're finding this massive amount of money. <laughs> and, and so I said, well, how are you going to carry that out? <laughs> I, I always wanted to ask uh, this question. It, it, would you, If, if you went back in time right now and took a picture or, or filmed that game, would you really call it role-playing? Or would you say that you were still some stumbling, still trying out things? Um, how different was it, the, the experience of, of play? Because there is a lot of people that still play those older editions, but time has passed and the way of, of playing it has developed even if we play the same games that existed before. It, was the game experience really different? Was it the same? Was it, it was, something? It was the same, but kind of more primitive in many ways. Um, I mean, frankly, it was definitely role playing because we didn't have all of these great toys and visual aids and all this stuff. All we had was like white, you know, notebook paper and, and you know, hand drawn maps on graph paper. and. Uh, and so, you know, you had no figures, you didn't have anything. So it's it was all that what you know what people like to call theater of the mind right now, which I just call role playing because that's that's really what we always did. <laughs> and what was it that that uh, you liked so much about it that you ended up uh, dedicating a lot of your life to this industry? What what was that made you fall in love with uh, role playing games? 
Well, it was because you really could, you know, I love science fiction, fantasy, all this stuff, a lot of old, and uh, you could really, you know, go and, and, you know, be creative. You could create these stories. I mean, I was, a, I was, an, I was an English major theater minor. So this was all very much like, oh, stories, ooh, acting, kind of thing, ooh, building little sets and stuff. <laughs> um, and and I was playing with a lot of uh, several of people, one of um, you know, people who went on to be like writers for television and some stuff like this. And it was yeah, we could do we we could do stories, and uh, you know, and then there were other guys who went on to become lawyers and everything. So, <laughs> um, but and and yeah, it was that idea that you know you could really kind of come up with anything that wasn't it wasn't the everybody's going to sit around and argue about you know did you move that piece the wrong way and you know oh by the way you forgot this rule in subcase 27 there were so many there were so few rules and it became and it was pretty pretty clear that there was you know there were just lots of gi gigantic gaps in the in those rules that so you know constantly the referee was having to go like Oh, I don't know. Just just do that, <laughs> and, and was and was making stuff up, and um, and that's when I discovered that hey, I kind of like kind of making things up for games, and uh, and it was very satisfying. I, so, I would like to 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 link a, this exact moment to a question like, how did you end up working for TSR? Like uh, this this whole thing leads to. <laughs> Well, this whole thing led to me actually uh, graduating college and then going off and being a teacher because there are, there are no other jobs for English majors. Uh, <laughs> it's like uh, you go off and it, you know you go off and you teach high school kids if you're lucky who who might be interested a little bit in what you're doing. And I did that for two years in a little town in the middle of nowhere. Um, I don't know what the Argentine equivalent of the little middle of nowhere would be, but um, it was a it was a town of, of 300 people, um, and uh, you know, just it was really small, um, and uh, did that for two years and learned amongst other things that I am not well suited to being a teacher, and in in that I can teach people and I like. Kind of that kind of interaction, but I didn't like doing all the other stuff, and and uh, so still played, uh, kind of kept up with the role playing thing, even though that you know it, it was a you know fifty like, like almost a it was it was more like a seventy mile drive to get to uh, a a place with a game store where you know one could play games and stuff like that. So maybe once a month or every two months would we could afford to go do that and uh would play games and uh got dragon magazine and all that and one day they ran an ad in dragon magazine that they were looking to, to hire designers um they didn't know what what that how to hire designers because they'd never hired them before <laughs> but <laughs> but uh so i looked at it talked with my wife and she said go ahead Give it a go. She she liked she liked games too because it was something to do and all this, um, and so I, you know, sent in a, a letter and got back this list of questions that they sent, which was like twenty some random questions, and some of them were like, okay, how how familiar are you with the rules about things? Others were questions were like, describe the difference between these three different types of weird pole arms, or, you know, what is this heraldry symbol called? And it's like, really? Okay. <laughs> and and this was all pre-internet days, too, so, you know, you had, to, you had to kind of do a little digging to find some of the answers at times. Um, and then also they wanted then a short adventure kind of writing sample thing. And so I put something together and, you know, kind of sent it off and didn't really think much was going to happen of it. And to my surprise, they contacted me and said, well, yeah, we'd like to have you come to Lake Geneva uh, for interview. And, you know, Lake Geneva was two states away. And um, I, I'm, I'm basically an English teacher working on poverty wages, as it were. Um, and so, you know, the idea was that I would fly to Lake Geneva and they would then, you know, you know, interview me. And then I had to say, look, I can't afford to buy a plane ticket. <laughs> You're going to have to get a plane ticket for me. <laughs> uh, and they did. 
And I flew up to Lake Geneva or flew up to whatever was close to Lake Geneva and took the bus then from there to, to Lake Geneva. And where I stood on the street corner until a, uh, until a car eventually showed up and uh, Gary Gygax uh, and his wife, because Gary didn't drive, so his wife drove him, picked me up, and then you know we did started the whole interview thing and there were there were about i think uh they had kind of their started their design department they had two or three people kind of already um that um and so but uh i was i was employee number 24 at that point out of the whole company <laughs> wow that's amazing that's an amazing way to to, to get in to <laughs> Yeah, I would never. I would never hire me today. You know, knowing, <laughs> knowing, knowing what I know now, I would never have hired that guy. <laughs> so, sorry, when when was this? Uh, oh, this was 1979. Is when I started working there. Amazing. So, I have a, a small question. Is it true that they didn't book you a, a hotel room and you had to? Sleeping. I, I, no, I didn't. You know, they, they were so, yeah, they didn't know how to do this whole interview process either. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and so I literally, you know, it went um, a, after kind of doing interviewing with the various people in the office, uh, went back to Gary's house and uh, I think had dinner there and uh, then wound up basically uh, sleeping on a couch kind of out on their, on their uh, kind of patio, their. Uh, Their, their screened in port, their closed in porch. Um, and, you know, because, yeah, there was, that was there was no other place. To, <laughs> and so, so yeah, I, yeah, I, you know, it was kind of weird, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, I'd never been flown anywhere for an interview before either. So I didn't know what to expect. <laughs> wow. So, so uh, I have a question uh, regarding the, The sets of DD. So you, you are the name behind the expert set of Dungeons and Dragons. And, and here in Latin America, most of the oldest players we have, uh, they started with AD&D second edition. Mm -hmm. We didn't get to know a lot about DD Basic and Expert. Could you tell us a little bit more about the idea behind it? Well, the idea behind Basic and Expert was really, um, it was We were working at A, it came out before really uh, AD&D came out um, and, and it was uh, first, first and foremost, it was an attempt to take those little booklets and turn them into kind of like one kind of single thing that you could buy and get started playing um, with rules that were much more in, uh, understandable uh, uh, and better organized and and streamlined and the first book the first book the the, the blue base the the blue john holmes book was really this uh, and john holmes basically you know said hey i can help you guys out by you know putting together this this uh, set of uh, version of the rules that is more kind of like market friendly than the little booklets and stuff were and uh, and they were they were very aware that you know We need. We, they needed to kind of turn D and D into, into. They always wanted D and D to be mass market. They always wanted to, you know. And so they needed to turn it into, uh, change it in ways that would make it, you know, much easier for people to just get into and get started. Because it was really hard to explain to people, you know, what you needed and everything. And you know, and the rules didn't really. Ex the, those little um, booklets didn't really explain anything about like, oh, what you're going to do or how this game works or anything. We're just kind of like, all right, and here you go. <laughs> um, so then they just, at that point though, then they wanted to um, kind of get D&D its own kind of brand line as opposed to AD&D because they were very aware that, oh, like we're working on this AD&D thing, but we still need something that we can introduce players to. And originally the idea was that it would be a, you know, that there was a thought that it could be a stripped down version of AD&D and then at the end you would you know, play this and then you would go into AD&D, but that quickly got, that quickly went by the way. And I know there's, there's all sorts of theories about, you know, how Gary was trying to screw Dave or Dave was trying to, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, I never heard any of that stuff. I was, I never paid any attention to it, I think, or if it was, or, it, or it's just overblown. Uh, but, but um, 
So, but the idea was that we wanted them to basically come out with a couple of sets, the basic and then the expert set that would allow you to actually grow and develop a whole, you know, whole line all of its own uh, and have them again, be very accessible because we were discovering that, you know, college students were great, but you know, there was <laughs> lots of much younger people were really buying the game. And uh, so giving them something that would, did not require like, you know, an, a dictionary and an encyclopedia to kind of figure out half of what was going on was was a good idea. Uh, so that's really kind of the intention of it, and it it basically yeah it succeeded in that D and D all it was uh, survived as a separate line for quite a long time. Um, you know, much creating much confusion in its wake because there was D and D and there was AD and D and what the heck is going on. Um, but it was a popular. It was it. It had the virtue of being much faster to play uh, and a little less complicated, though by the end of it, of course, we'd always add on more and more stuff. And, you know. But uh, so, it was, so it was, yeah, more accessible for many people. And that was an important part. And it's still being played to this day. Oh, uh, I still play it. <laughs> right. Wow. So that's, that's the, the proof that it's, it's still playable. Let's go back to TSR. You worked uh, for TSR for close to 15 years, if I'm not mistaken, something like yeah. that, right? Yeah, so, you've done your homework well. Uh, it's well, we are journalists <laughs> and we are from another country, so we have to <laughs> we have to do our work. So, uh, what was working for TSR like? I mean, uh, what was uh, the work environment like? Because in some ways TSR was growing really fast, uh, and in some other ways it was still. Uh, I don't want to be um, harsh with the word, but um, amateur or, or uh, a beginning <laughs> combat company, right? Uh, take it. Oh, we the, made all, we made all sorts of mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, originally when I got hired, they they started growing them, and then within about a year, the the whole uh, uh, Dallas Egbert disappearing in the steam tunnels thing, all this publicity hit about D and D and suddenly everything went crazy. You know, we, you know, we, 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 uh, we were having trouble keeping up with orders, demand, all this sort of stuff. We, we didn't have a pipelines put together for, you know, Oh wow, we need to get, people want to buy stuff. We don't have anything to sell them new. We got, we had to get, make new things and, you know, sell them to them. We didn't know Gary had done, like the first early modules uh, right before uh, I joined and those, you know, the giant series and this sort of stuff. And hey, these things sell, so we should do more of those. And so we started doing modules and this sort of stuff. But all this other stuff, like, you know, what else can we make? What else can we sell? What else What else do people want? You know, how big should it be? You know, how much are they willing to pay? Um, everything, we didn't know, we didn't know. So we were literally, um, making it up as we went along and you know so you saw a lot of things that we did some of them worked some of them were maybe not so successful <laughs> uh and and we would try the we, we were trying we hadn't figured out for the longest time that oh having a whole campaign setting and all of this sort of stuff uh really was you know it was really was key to to both selling and but also to Uh, really getting people kind of hooked in. You know, it's like, oh, it's not just, oh, I played this adventure in my friend's game. Oh, I played this adventure in this campaign world that I can now talk to somebody who's not in my friend's game and they understand kind of, oh yeah, I play, I play in that world too, kind of a thing. Um, and, and so, you know, the, technically a lot of the stuff was supposedly set in Greyhawk. But the problem was get, Greyhawk belonged to Gary, sent, um, both literally in, in terms of copyright and stuff, but also uh, at that time, I mean, it belonged to him as he was creator and he was, he had, he had kind of final say control over Greyhawk. And so we would make these things and then they would never really get kind of reviewed, approved for Greyhawk, but we still had to publish them. So they just went out and we didn't say where it was, right? We didn't, we didn't. You know, it just, it just, it was a thing. And only, only some things were actually like, oh, this is part of Greyhawk because, you know, those are the ones that uh, Gary had taken the time to say, you know, or had the time to actually go and say, yes, this is, you know, 
and you know some of them are things he wrote some of them are things he he worked with you know people who you know he had his own kind of circle of people in many ways uh and then, then there was a lot of us we were we had to supply um you know originally we were you know supply oh we got to do like 12 products here oh my god how are we going to do that and the next year oh we got to do 20 products oh wait yeah. and i think towards the the high high period of stuff we had to provide you know about a hundred some products a year and it wasn't like they hired it wasn't like they ran out and said oh we need to hire 10 more people <laughs> it was like oh yeah you know, we hired you one more guy <laughs> and with the rose tinted glasses uh, of the past what do you say uh, was the best thing about uh, working for TSR what what do you remember as uh, your fondest memory from, from oh, that era yes. there are a lot of fond memories the best thing was the people i worked with uh, uh, we hired a lot of very very creative uh, uh, smart people um, you know and um, form friendships there that have still you know I still see these people and occasionally get hired by them for other things or hire them for other have hired them for other things this sort of stuff. And so it's really it was the the people you got to work with and the and just kind of the kind of crazy stories and all that sort of stuff. The other part of it is, you know, I got to do things I would never have gotten to do as, you know, as a as an English teacher somewhere. Um uh, and you know, so It was there were lots of there were lots of interesting experiences and uh, all this sort of stuff. Got to see my name in print, uh, all that stuff. And yeah, there are there are lots of crazy stories, and some of which I can almost remember. <laughs> and we heard um, a lot of, of crazy stories about TSR. I even heard a story of people falling through a roof. Yes, <laughs> yes, that did happen. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell um, us? Told, fell through the ceiling into my office into your office <laughs> <laughs> could you could you share with us how how did this happen well this was this was kind of early on um and we were still in the uh the down this building in downtown lake geneva which was basically it was this three-story old hotel with a big and um and uh the, dun the dungeon hobby shop was on the main floor our uh our shipping department and, and everything was essentially in the basement and uh then the second floor was like you know the art artists and the bosses and a few things like that and the third floor was basically designers and editors and this stuff so, and this building was probably if we hadn't been in it probably would have been condemned um you know it was it, the, the floors none of the floors were level they were all you know, in, in slightly different angles you know and this sort of stuff you could put a marble down and it would roll in different directions depending on where you were in the hall kind of a thing <laughs> um so and so on basically we're pretty much you know we late thursday friday it was a late friday night lots of people on friday a lot of people go home you know kind of find excuses to leave early this sort of thing and there were just a few of us left on the top floor and not really i don't think there was like anybody else really none of none of the bosses downstairs were around that we knew of this sort of thing um and one of the things was there was this door on the um on in the in the on the floor that we knew went up to There was a fourth floor that supposedly was a ballroom, but that door was always locked, and it was like, "Yeah, don't go up there." Okay. Well, that that day, that door was unlocked for some reason, and one of our artists did, uh, decided to go up there and explore because he was hanging around, and so it was up there, and it's this old, dark, musty place. So I never went. I didn't go up because I was busy doing other stuff, right? But I can only imagine there was like no lighting or anything up there, so it was all dark kind of thing and there was like really no floor you know there was this he was kind of jumping from beams to beams to kind of get through it safely and uh, and at one point missed <laughs> and and the floor part there was really just the ceiling up there. <laughs> and so i was down the hall talking to somebody and there was this very loud crash and and some and voices and got back down to my office and saw basically a pair of legs dangling in the ceiling <laughs> so we he was really, we, he we was got really him, we helped him out in adventuring <laughs> yeah. and uh, then then you know 
the bosses had to be told and that was saying fortunately i didn't have to do that and then i think the, uh, for as long as i was in that office uh there was just basically this big kind of sheet of plywood patch on the in on the <laughs> so uh, you you talked about uh, the bosses and, and everything uh, what would you say was uh, the worst part about uh, tsr what, what grind your gears uh, oh there, there were a lot of things there were broken promises that's probably the biggest biggest thing we were we were promised at various points that we would have royalties on things and then when they discovered a you know royalties a are a they would have to pay out a lot of money uh and b that uh that royalties in a shared world were kind of complicated and so they said oh no we'll do we'll do bonuses on things and when it came to ten payout bonuses they uh yeah that didn't really happen and so there was a, there was there were a lot of like yeah we were all going to make some money and it turned out that well not quite so much um we were paid salary and uh, you know occasionally we you know we would do special projects where they had no choice but say okay we got to get this done so we're going to have to pay you know pay, pay you some extra because this is going to be the kind of brutal uh and in fact it turned out that uh books uh novels were were this interesting because technically you could if you got um them to uh, approve you to write a novel well technically you are not a you are not in the book department you were a game designer so that meant that they uh, you did get a separate contract to do that um and but that also meant you had to do it on your own time <laughs> um, but that meant that was so that was an incentive for a number of people to kind of you know get into the novel side of things and you know uh so Tracy started Tracy Hickman started it as a designer Uh, Troy Denning started as an editor and then went over and then you know started doing novels and um you know and various other people a lot of, um a lot of them kind of started in different positions elsewhere in the company a few of them then later on in the, eventually the even folks who were in the book department were writing novels because they had to, you know we need they needed the material and so um Jim Lauder and some other folks you know started you know getting the opportunities too instead of just editing other people's novels and, and then you know so it was again uh, a, a lot it was a great training ground for a lot of things and you know so that was probably one of the biggest things you know there there were lots of other petty things that you know, can annoy the hell out of you but uh. yeah. <laughs> some, some of the highlights <laughs> so over there you were a designer of ad and d second edition an yes. edition that to this day many people consider to be the highest point of D&D well, I'll take I'll take that, take that. Yes. <laughs> I like we, that we hear that a lot so how did that project started like well that project started because um we had the same problem with AD&D that we do that every every line we ever have always gets the problem where you start putting out more and more material and it gets really big and it gets really complicated and you know you've got you know the question comes up oh can we use the rules that showed up in unearth arcana in this product or can oh what about this can we use all this and hey this rule over here contradicted this one over here and there are 87 different ways to do the same thing and all sorts of stuff like this uh so it was the we needed to you know there was this kind of awareness that we needed to do basically kind of a reissue and originally it was just going to start out being kind of a reissue of AD&D um and Gary that that's kind of what Gary had been planning incorporate you know incorporate some of this stuff get it officialized as it were and do it that way um and then Gary left the com get left the company and we still have this yeah we we're going to do this and Steve Winter who is the editor uh um going to be the editor on it basically he he really lobbied for the idea of you know the big the goal is let's just first and foremost let's just get this book organized because you know lots of people love original D&D but it is a very quirky set of books <laughs> um it's you know strangely organized and uh the language is some sometimes very difficult and sometimes the rules are you know, sparse or overly complicated you know take your choice um and so 
um, the idea is like, let's get this, pre you know, presented yet more once again, and that learning how to do things better, kind of let's get this more professional, easier to access, make it a proper kind of a reference book. And we had a big debate are we about are we trying to teach people how to play AD and D in the with the books, or are we you know setting this up for people who know how to play but need to be able to find stuff and reference and do all that sort of thing? And we kind of, we lean, we ultimately went more for the second where you know this was not meant to be here's how to play D and D, but more of a okay here's all the stuff you need to play the game that you know, and we'll we'll teach you other elsewhere how to play it. I don't know if that was, was that the best decision, worst? I don't know. Seems to have worked so far. <laughs> um, so. And then I got brought in. Yeah, I got brought in to uh, came out basically be, you know, it needs a designer because there had there were a bunch of like, there were lots of designer type decisions that needed to be made. Like, you know, when, when rule Y contradicts rule Z, which one do we want to go with? And, and that led to how can we, you know, how can we, you know, start making the game, you know, incorporating in all of these house rules that players had you know there was a there was a pretty well established body of rules that never were published anywhere but everybody kind of knew oh yeah yeah this is what we'll do and it was amazing how how they were all very similar from you know different campaigns all over the place and so we wanted to get all that to be kind of like okay this is a game you're all very familiar with and uh you know i went out and as part of this and when i was writing it we went off to conventions and basically, you know, reassured people, no, 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 we are not blowing up your game. We are not, you know, doing horrible things. We're just trying to make it the way that you guys are playing it now. Um, and um, that also meant we couldn't do certain things. We thought about changing the armor class so that it went uh, up instead of down, you know, because in some ways, logically, and, and uh, it is uh, easier to imagine armor class getting better with a higher number than it is to say, oh, and now I go into negative two and all this sort of stuff. And there were, then then I have to do mental hijinks to figure out some of the uh, like, oh, did I hit, you know, you know, all that. But we couldn't do all that. We couldn't change, make those kinds of changes because uh, again, it needed to be the game people were familiar with. And also we had a whole lot of product in the warehouse that was still original, you know, original A, A, D, A, D, and D. And uh, we had to make sure that they don't, that that would still be sellable, <laughs> um, and that was that was that was a big big concern of our of our sales and marketing side and our and our finance people. It's like as they approved this and kind of got going on, they realized, oh wait a minute, this this could kill our sales. For <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, it could it could the the, the problem their their front fear was we would come out with these books and they could do well, they could do very well, but they wouldn't have there would be no material no follow-on material if we did if if they didn't if players didn't look at it and go like oh i can still buy this old product right then there was no other there was no other income coming in but that until we could build up a whole new supply um so they were concerned and we had we had and it and it took some uh some careful work by the marketing people i think to make it all you know so, you know make that transition we did we put a lot of attention towards it tries we got closer to kind of, you know, reassuring the player base about the transition, showing them, hey, this is how it works, you know, coming up with, you know, kind of guides to, uh, you, know, mod you know, modify old material to new uh, and this sort of stuff so that, you know, we wouldn't, that we wouldn't lose too many people if we could help it. Wow. So, uh, like, you, in, in, the, in the time you wrote an article for Dragon Magazine, where you shared your view on what classes should be left out of the new edition. What's, what was your criteria for deciding what would stay or what would go? So this marketing uh, side of things, you you were working uh, deeply in this in this project. Yeah. So yeah, we were we were pretty far along at that point. Um, and uh, Jim Ward, who was our, our creative director boss, said, hey, we wanted an article that would basically um, generate some controversy. <laughs> and uh, 
So we decided, you know, let's talk about, you know, the character classes and what we're doing with them and and uh, which ones we weren't going to use. Because some of these came out of, you know, Unearthed Arcana. There was a lot of question was all is on the Unearthed Arcana official or not, all this sort of stuff. Um, and so that became the, infa- the kind of the infamous Who Dies article. Um, and some of it was, yes, I was definitely responsible for some of this. I never liked the assassin the way it was done uh, because it was to me uh, two had two really big problems. One is that because it was so driven by, oh, I have this chance to assassinate table kind of a thing and everything, you'd see way too many people going like, oh, I walk up to the guy, I'm going to roll on the table. Oh, did I kill him? <laughs> You know, I, I, I did that to Thor. He's dead now, you know, <laughs> um, as opposed to, and, and it really, to my mind, destroyed a lot of the, if I'm going to be an assassin, this is really about role playing. This is really about, you know, plotting and scheming and, you know, working all that stuff out. And, uh, you know, if even if you had a table like that, you should only be like, you know, using that only after you've described in you know, excruciating detail to your, to your, you know, your DM exactly how you're going to pull this assassination off kind of a thing. And, and it wasn't being used that way. The other part of it, which was the kind of a little bit more serious problem, is it was so rampant that if there was an assassin in the party, eventually that party just wound up falling apart because sooner or later the assassin is just going to stick somebody else in the group. <laughs> and, and and then just bad blood develops and you know you know gaming groups get all you know and uh, and so it was like this this is not a character that, class that was really good in some ways for party harmony so like i i was kind of like that the monk while i did oriel adventures which was much more appropriate setting for the monk and we had that sort of stuff and so uh you know i i I argued that, you know, the monk as it was presented was really belonged in Oriental Adventures and should just stay there. Uh, and, you know, if we ever redo Oriental Adventures for second edition, then yay, we have the monk, you know. Um, and and so it, it didn't fit really well. Uh, those, I think, were real. I don't know. The, the barbarian the barbarian was, was badly out of balance. Um, and uh, the cavalier, I think, was even worse in that sense um that you know once you really start playing with them they were so overpowered compared to the other uh, other uh, classes of you know especially the other fighter type classes that well we needed you know we needed to kind of find ways to bring them you know back in line i think when the case of the cavalier it was such a such a narrow focus kind of thing that it's just like yeah we'll just we'll just not do anything with that one at the moment we only had so much space in the rules after all um and and then the others, you know, the, the Barbarian, I think we simplified down quite a bit. I don't even remember. He may have, like, at best of these days, like a passing mention as a kind of specialist kind of uh, um, fighter without any real rules detail because we spent that effort on the Ranger to show how you could do these things. And the idea with each of the character classes is we'd kind of stay here is the core type, you know, um, you know, the wizard, the fighter, this, and then we would do, oh, and here's, here is a specialist to give you an example of how you can take this and, you know, work with it. And, you know, and hopefully I was, I was always, I was always in the believer at this point that, you know, these were things that people were going to go off and they were going to modify. They were going to, they were going to create an add to, as opposed to, um, what you see sometimes now, um, which is more, oh, these are the rules and then they are meant to be done exactly as so. There's that business with Gary. Um, you know, Gary w- very clearly states that you know the rules were in were guidelines and inspirations, and he states that early on. And then later on, was no, the rules are were exact and must be played exact. And that was a little bit of a reaction to trying to keep the game work. You know, work so it would work for conventions and tournaments and stuff like that. Um, and a little bit of like you know just insane and you know badly put together all you know things that were happening and so um but i was always a little bit of the approach that that any set of rules for it to really grab hold of somebody uh they have to go they have to be able to go in and make some changes 
uh, so that then it becomes their game as opposed to oh i play that game amazing yeah and with the ven with the benefit of hindsight do you do you think you you did everything you wanted with second edition um i'm going back and look at second edition and i I find I find things that make me cringe. <laughs> It's like, oh my god, I wrote that. I'm really sorry. <laughs> uh, and I find other things that were really good. There were there were some ideas I thought were really good that didn't take off, um, and so we didn't use them. Um, and all of this also, as I was saying, wasn't like I was making all of these decisions, you know, in a vacuum by myself. We would have, you know, weekly, sometimes or usually biweekly meetings with. You know the rest of the design department, really all the other designers, where we would talk. We would go over like these are the things that we were thinking of doing. These are, and there would be much back and forth discussion, uh, and sometimes you know sometimes debate, but most of the time it's like okay, that's a good idea. But have you thought about this? Or hey, what what about X or Z? And then we had um, working as part of the team. John, you know, there were three of us. Really, it was myself and Steve Winter and then John Pickens and and then and Jim Ward also looking at it as the creative director um, and each of us basically we all had to be in agreement yeah oh yes we need to do this John was very good about because um, he ran all the play tests and got and gathered the play test comments and the feedback and all this stuff from the outside groups he was very good about kind of making sure that hey you know stick stick to what You know, A D and D is don't go don't wandering off too much. Don't and you know he would he was kind of he would be kind of adamant at times. No, no, no. It has to be. We have to keep that in. Or no, you can't make you can't change it that that way. Um, and you know he, he he was quite frequently right. And, and uh, so we 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 learned to listen to each other. <laughs> Yeah, so there were there were a lot of things. That, yeah, would I do it differently today? Yes, almost certainly. But then I'm not the same person I was then either. <laughs> yeah. So you were working on TCR, TSR, sorry, at the time that Gary Gygax left the company. <laughs> Did this have any effect on the developers of the game? Um. Yes, but not necessarily in ways people think. Uh, we had. When Gary was running the the design, you know, was was really running the company more directly. Originally, when when we started, the company and Gary was running the company at that point. Um, the company wasn't huge, and so it was fairly. It was still easy. It was easier to manage and do all this stuff and be be much more hands on involved as uh, on in all of the in a lot of the design and this sort of stuff, and you know have have eyes on all sorts of things. And then Gary went off, and then um, Blooms took over. And then when the Blooms started implode, and Gary came back, well, the company by this point is much larger, and he could not run the company the way he had before, uh, which was really kind of like you know, yeah, let's see what you're doing, let's have a talk about this, this sort of stuff, because there was no time. He was dealing with all sorts of other. He was dealing with you know, much bigger issues, and there were like you know, we were generating like a hundred product. A year and this sort of stuff, um, and or at least we were supposed to be generating a lot of product, and so it became more difficult for actually a lot of the designers because we had had a little bit more of a free hand uh, under the blooms about because they were like, yeah, yeah, that sounds good, go do that, um, and and um, it it was when Gary came back, he he was much more about like, no, not going to do that. Yeah, no, not. Um, so a lot of a lot of very interesting ideas and directions and stuff. It became it became harder to kind of get those through. And then when Gary left and you know for the second time, uh, really what happened is that the designers were really you know suddenly kind of like, oh, we have to figure out direction for stuff uh, because we have a lot of upper management that you know some of them do, but you know are. A lot of our senior management, they were not gamers, uh, and they were business people, and so it was it was upon us to kind of figure out, you know, what is it we're going to do? What's what's what is a good idea for what should be done? And this is where you started to see things like, you know, I mean, I I can't I don't remember 
Greyhawk started, when exactly Greyhawk started, if it was before or after Gary left. But, you know, part of the idea with Greyhawk was that we needed a setting. We needed a setting where we could put all of this material that we had been generating that didn't have a home uh, and and basically have it be one that TSR owned and controlled, as, as it were, although we kind of viewed it as one that we, the designers, owned and controlled. <laughs> um, um, and and so, you know, and that this is what, this was a key thing that I've been missing. And when Gary was there with Greyhawk, we weren't, you could not put through the idea easily. Let's create another setting. Uh, and at the same time, I realized, like I said before, you ran into that problem of if you wanted to create something and set it in Gary, Greyhawk, you had to really get Gary's complete, you had to get Gary's buy off on it. And he saw often just didn't have time or whatever to to really do that. Um, and so so that was there were those there were all these kind of like little weird roadblock challenges that we had to find ways to try and work around and that sort of stuff. And then, you know, suddenly when you know all the designers kind of like in charge of the of the the, the design aspects of stuff, that was like, oh wait, we can do anything. So we had to then get told, no, that was a bad idea, don't do that. <laughs> So let's let's talk about another setting, a setting you are famous for, which is Planescape. Oh, you are the, you. The, the lead designer of Planescape, which is, uh, by the way, on the news uh, again because of the new edition that uh, uh, Wizards of the Coast has has published. But the original Planescape, the one you you wrote, how did that, that come to be? How how did that start? So the, the 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 original thing, and this is kind of the example of how the designs change and evolve before they get out, was that originally uh, another designer um, uh, working at the company, I think it was Slade, uh, had suggested that because we had done these magic books where there was like all the magic encyclopedia books and all this sort of stuff, and he said, "Hey, let's let's do let's do something for the planes like that." Um, Jeff had done manual of the planes a while back, and it, you know we had nice stuff in it. But you know we can expand on that. We could do, and he proposed literally doing like a a a, a book for every plane. And we thought, well, that that's nice, but I'm not sure who's going to buy the the planes of absolute good book, you know, <laughs> or, you know, or this sort of stuff. It's going to be a little tough. <laughs> Um, and it was just you know that was it was just too much of a, too big big in terms of a uh, too many titles on a line and that sort of stuff. Um, but the idea of like, hey, we should do something with the plane stuck around. Um, and so I wound up having available time in my schedule so that it was like, would you, you know, I, do you have some ideas for this? And I do, I always, you know, I'll think about anything for five minutes and I'll have ideas. Um, um, but, and then at the same time, the the instruction that kind of from uh uh jim jim ward was that okay we, we wanted it to be a a campaign setting and and not just a oh you know, hey here's a place that you go to once and you never go back again kind of a thing um and we had jeff had done uh kind of the most previously had been uh spell jammer which was a really great idea uh and he did great stuff with it but the thing that seemed to happen with it, and this, mind you, kind of anecdotal, was that players were, were, you know, the GMs would buy it and would kind of use it as, oh, let's go have a one-off adventure out here, and then we'll go back to our regular campaign, right? Because, you know, it was just, you know, it didn't have quite the, a central home focus kind of a thing to it. And so the idea was, you know, do this for the planes, but make sure that there is a that it's all entirely kind of self-contained. There is a there's a place that you start you start the campaign from and all this sort of stuff. And then and so the other thing is that at that time, um, White Wolf with their vampire stuff was was getting all of the kind of critical fans going, ooh, ooh, look at this, this is trendy, this is edgy, this is cool. Uh TSR is so stodgy and, and dull. <laughs> And so we, uh, um, you know, it was, you know, it was like come up with some stuff also that's got to kind of work a little bit like the the, uh, 
the different clan, the, you know, the, the, the example is the clans in, in uh, Vampire, that, you know, to have something the players can really identify with in, in terms of that. And that led to all of the, the different factions in, in Planescape you know, that you could join and this sort of stuff. And, and at that point, I don't know, I think I just, um, I've been working there for almost, you know, probably 12 years by that point. And I had done all sorts of, I mean, all sorts of products and everything. And so it was starting to look for, you know, what can I do something that's really, you know, I haven't done before. Um, and that's where I went off the deep end with landscape. <laughs> um, I had been reading, uh, I, I read a lot of history and, uh, I've been reading a lot about um, oh uh, English thieves in, in 17th century and Elizabethan times both, and some stuff like this. And so a lot of the cant came out of all that. Um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the kind of the attitude part. And the other part was you know you know if we want if we wanted factions, then we need to give we needed to give them kind of uh, cartoon examples of different world world philosophies. So, you know, so you wound up with, you know, the idea, and I think we, we finally realized it was essentially it's philosophers with clubs that I, this is the way the world should be, and I will pound you into the ground until you accept it kind of a thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was, you know, it was that excuse to be a source of conflict and everything. And, <laughs> excuse Amazing. me. Amazing. So, yeah. yeah. But then the other thing that happened is also Dark Sun had come out, um, and one of the things that they had done with Dark Sun is that Troy um, had lobbied for and gotten a dedicated artist for it. Uh, and with that, then they were able to develop a very defined kind of look and feel to the whole thing. And so they said, that worked pretty good. Let's do that again. And it turned out that uh, artist, one of the staff artists, Dana Knutson, had like a month gap in his schedule where they didn't have anything really scheduled for him. And so I said, okay, you do 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 concept sketches and all this new concept stuff. And so he started laying out, like we worked out lots of things like the, the architecture and uh, and like all the faction symbols and came up with the late, came up with the lady of pain and just came up with the image. And we weren't, didn't have any real like, oh yeah, I didn't ask him to make this, but he made this thing and he said, oh wow, we have to get this into the game somehow. <laughs> and that's where I, that's where the, and that's literally why the, I then created the lady of pain. So we could have this figure floating around through the city. <laughs> And, wow. Uh, um, and wow. and then when it when uh, they went to uh, do the final art for all the interiors, that's when Tony, uh, who had been doing stuff for us uh, in uh, like the uh, monster manuals and stuff, our, our art director said, you know, I think I have this artist who can do this, do a really good, good job on this because he has this very, you know, Tony-esque kind of style. <laughs> um, and Tony was, as he will tell you, he was young and uh, eager and so said, sure, I'll do the whole thing, not realizing how much work he was signing himself up for. But he did. <laughs> and, uh, and it, you know, and the results were really great and they fit just perfect. They fit perfectly with kind of like, you know, what we, what I had been doing and uh, what we were, and yeah, and then, you know, the editor and I and graphic designers all got very passionate about how we wanted to put it together and everything. And so, you know, it yeah, it worked out quite great. I'm not sure it's completely playable. I'm not sure there's and there's some of my ideas in there that are maybe not like maybe maybe having the the uh Dabas guys who only speak in little little rebus uh, uh word puzzles is maybe wasn't maybe the most practical thing, but it was fun. <laughs> Well, that that's actually something that today it's it has a lot a, a, a whole other context. Like we 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 use chat uh, symbol symbols in our chatting uh, usually with with our cell phones. So <laughs> like we we can resignify it. I don't know if that's a word, but I, I thought about it like in in that sense uh, today. I, I, of course, that, that's some rambling from me, but there's one question I would, we would really like to ask you. How do you pronounce the city of Dar's name? Sigil. 
Yeah, I, I've gotten asked this question just recently by somebody else too. It's kind of interesting um, through an email somebody needed to know. And so apparently there has been some controversy about how one spells, but it, but it is not sigil. It is sigil, the way the word is supposed to be pronounced. <laughs> and also uh, in Spanish, if we would read it without context, uh, we might say sigil, like he. <laughs> so, because that's how we pronounced it. Well, I'm sure we mut I'm sure we mutilate Spanish words too. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, um, besides that, one of the biggest parts of playing Planescape is sigil. How did the city of Doors came to be? Well, we needed that campaign center, uh, and so that's what the City of Doors is. It's that place you go to when you're done with your adventures, this sort of place, and you could live there and not get killed instantly. But it needed to be, you know, still needed to feel weird, and it's uh, it was the excuse to get all of these things from all of the planes together, kind of wandering the streets. Um, and, you know, so you go, oh, ooh, look, there's a demon over there. Oh, yeah, maybe I won't poke him, but, <laughs> but all this sort of stuff. And, and also it appeals very much to my sense of fantasy in that I, I, am, I am much more interested in fantasy that is illogical, uh, that, that is impossible because that isn't that what fantasy is supposed to be about. And, uh, you know, if you go back and you read like old, you know, Norwegian, you know, you know, sagas and this sort of stuff, things happen that it's like, you know, and then, you know, you know, to to create this thing, you need the whisper of a cat. Well, how do you get the whisper of a cat? You know, all this, this thing, all these, you know, fairy tale kind of things that you had to do. Um, and in some ways, uh, Sigil and the whole Outlands and everything lets you do that. It's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a city inside a Taurus. Why I chose to do that, I don't know, but it was interesting. <laughs> Um, and and it uh, and it sits at the at the top of an infinitely tall spire, which you know is you know a complete paradox and an impossibility. Um, and but yet you know you just say yeah it is. <laughs> and um, and and so there was part of that part of that fun and being able to try and like you know hopefully inspire you know the the, the GMs and players to say. I don't have to explain everything always in logical ways. I just have to say this thing is and it works, right? And then then that adds to the mystery of of the of the place, the the location, the adventure, whatever it is you're trying to do. Um, whereas if you explain everything and if you have too many rules about stuff, then it then it just becomes a game mechanics. And and you know it's you know then all you're telling your players is all right go figure out how to break these rules, <laughs> and, you know how to how to how to figure out how to abuse these rules so you know that sort of thing. It's a little bit of that you know we came out with deities and demigods and we would then get like letters from from young kids usually about like how you know they had killed Thor and we could take him out of the book now kind of a thing. <laughs> it's like okay I think. We didn't explain the point well enough about these. <laughs> Amazing. Wow. <laughs> that, that, that part of the little gates. <laughs> so sweet. <laughs> um, well, a little bit more in the future, you part your ways with TSR. Why? Mm -hmm. Part my ways with TSR? With TSR. Um, um, well, I had been there 15 years, like I said, and I had felt like I had done basically most every kind of thing that they're going to do, right? You know, there were, I, I had done the novels, I had done adventures, I had done source books, I had done campaign settings, I had done rule books. I, and I was starting to feel like things were a bit getting a little bit that I was repeating myself in some ways. Um, so there was that second, you know, I'd been there long enough that you, you were getting to the point in the pay scale where you're not going to be, you know, you're not going to be getting massive raises or anything like that. Um, and that's, and that's a pure practical thing. Right. And so one day, um, I got a call from a, uh, old coworker of mine. In fact, one of the people who hired me into TSR and he said, Hey, I'm, uh, I'm moved. He had left me you know, many years before. 
and had gone off to work at various computer game places, video game places. And he said he was setting up a uh, he was uh, setting up a studio for some folks, and uh, wanted to know if I would be interested in in uh, basically jumping ship and, and joining him. And 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 oh by the way, um, we'll pay you yet more again above what you're making right now. And um, yeah, so that was like oh yeah, I could do that right. Um, and the timing was good. My son was just moving out of like. Uh, uh, I think it was at that point he was moving out of out of grade school and into into junior high. So he was doing the, the big transition to a different school school a bracket and everything. So it was like, okay, we can you know we can do that. It, it'll be it'd be better to do it at that point than to do it like you know tear him away from someplace that, you know that he's kind of uh, you know gotten established in. And so, so yeah, uh, we went, and I wanted to learn more about video games because it didn't it didn't take a genius to see that you know video games were where things were going. Uh, you know that role playing games really, really had grown to about it seemed like at the time as far as they were going to grow. I mean, was I wrong? Yeah. Oh well, <laughs> they've grown more, but so have video games, and so I'm not too upset. <laughs> And so I went to work for this company that um, they didn't know what they were doing making games. The people who were in charge of the company, they were they were a web design place originally and wanted to kind of get into the whole CD-ROM game thing. And so we're going to set up this game division. And so that was interesting for a couple of years until it became pretty obvious that they really didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> And I got a call from another game company, uh, Interplay, um, because they had the Planescape license, and uh, there was a and they had a, they had actually acquired the Planescape license um, while I was still working at TSR, I think, or about that time. But there was a policy that uh, they were told that they could not poach uh, designers away from from uh, TSR, uh, or that would be pretty much, you know, that would that would create a lot of bad blood between them and, and TSR. And since they were licensing titles, they didn't want to do that. But uh, apparently my old boss, Jim Ward, was talking with them at one point uh, and had said, oh, and by the way, yeah, Zeb Cook doesn't work at TSR anymore. <laughs> and, then, and they were like, oh, because they had gotten the Planescape license. They were like, oh. <laughs> So I wound up getting a call from them and uh, uh, went went off to work then, which meant moving cross country, and uh, that again uh, worked for was pretty good for many years. They actually put out the best one of the best uh, computer game titles around for a long time, which was Planescape Torment, which interestingly enough I did not work on. <laughs> because, I, well, yeah, I wanted to ask you for that. <laughs> I was working on I was working on another Planescape title, and they launched that one up with a different team. And then the Planescape title I was working on, they said, which was uh, basically going to be a full 3D uh, kind of thing. Uh, they realized that a it was going to take longer to get out, and b they were already working on a Planescape title, and they would have if they came out with another one, they would have to pay royalties to TSR on that, whereas. They had their own title uh, that they had done years before that they wouldn't have to pay royalties on, uh, and so therefore we could do the new the the new ver we could do Stonekeep Two, uh, and Stonekeep Two was one of these kind of CD-ROM games a, a long time ago. It wasn't it was simplistic and everything, and we had, and you know we were not in a position where we could say no, we're not going to do that because we were employees, right? <laughs> Um, but we did at least say, hey, we am willing to do this as long as whatever we do doesn't have to have anything to do with actual stone keep. <laughs> it doesn't have to have anything to do with the first game, but we'll be you know, we'll we'll uh, do some nod to it and then we'll do whatever we want. And and so that went on for a while and then then I learned I learned some hard truths about video games at that point and that one never saw the light of day. Um uh, when when it's going to be there. It's when it's the boss's, you know, the, the company head's, you know, pet project, and he wants it to be the this, you know, techno technologically, 
you know, kind of a, that meant it never got finished because there was always like some new thing that needed to be done, right? <laughs> and so, yeah. So, so you you worked for a lot of video game companies. You work on, on Fallout 2. You worked uh, more recently for the Elder Scrolls Online. Mm -hmm. And what would you say are the main difference in the way that video game designers work as compared to uh, TTRPG designers? Well, the biggest one, and it was a hard one to learn at first, which is uh, when you're a TTR, when a tabletop designer has a huge amount of control um, because they are deciding all the rules. They are deciding, you know, usually a lot of times there's like one guy deciding, you know, creating the entire setting, writing all of the rules, you know, putting it all together. And so the game kind of is what you see in your head, uh, and then you have to be able to find a way to translate it onto paper. The problem with video game stuff is uh, very, very few people, and, and especially I think these days, I don't, I'm not sure anybody can be that, do that all. Um, because, you know, you have, you have engineers, you have to have artists, you have to have, um, you know, audio people, you have to have sound and all this other, all these things. And you can tell them what you want. You know, you can say, oh, and this is how it'll all work. And the engineers can say, don't, no, 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 those rules, I can't either. Those rules won't work properly when you try to do them in a, in a, in a you know, when we try to code them. Or wait, there is a better way to do this that you don't know. Right, and there, and so a lot of it is, you wind up not being the this person who can decide everything, but instead you are this person who is um, kind of saying this is this is kind of the picture of what we want, right? What we we're going to try and do, um, and and then trying to steer that, get everybody on it um, a lot, and a lot at the same time. You have a lot of other people who are equally creative, engineers, artists, all these sorts of things. And um, you want them also to be interested in, you know, they also want to be interested and engaged. They want to, they want to make things too. Um, and you have to, you have to learn to work with how can I, how can I make sure I'm listening to what other people want? Um, and, you know, can we fit that in or do we have, how do we tell them, no, that is not the kind of game we're making because, you know, you can wind up with a game where half the group is trying to make a serious role-playing kind of a game and another half of the group wants to make an action shooter. And, and these two things are very different, right? Um, and you need to kind of make sure everybody is, is moving in the same direction. And, and ultimately, you know, there are, there, there are so much work that there are, and the work is much more complicated that you wind up with designers who are very, who, who need to be very specialized. There are, are designers who deal strictly with, um, you know, the combat systems in the back end and the player balancing and all this sort of stuff. There are designers who deal with basically the content and the stories and the setting and all that sort of th those sorts of things. Um, And you know there are even you know designers who have to sit and figure out how to how do we do monetization is you know if we're having microtransactions how do we set those up how do we make those so we don't piss people off you know, um, you know because you have to do all that sort of thing and so there's there's a lot of there are a lot of very complicated areas that need need to have people just dedicated to working on those things and then they you have to make those people have to make sure that they are all talking to each other. So that you know the combat guy is not making something that simply won't work with the content and all this sort of stuff, um, and and then also then you know work with the chief technology officer or the graphics team who is like oh look look at this cool stuff we're implementing can you you know they'll come back and say we figured out how to do this you know you know we figured out how to make everything fog you know you can have like fog or you know how do you what do you want to do with it it's like oh we got to figure out what to do with that. <laughs> Or, or more importantly, it'll be like, no, we can't. We they'll come back and say, you can only have five guys on screen at a time, or you know, they'll say we need 60, and then there's going to have to be, you know, some back and forth. That, how do you figure out all that? How is that all going to work? Um, so it's it is a lot more collaborative uh, process, um, and it is, but at the same time, it is also, you know, and the hard part is, you know, trying to be. You know, the person says, "But look, this is this is the vision of what we do." And I, I have done it 
badly at times and I've done it better at other times. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. That those are huge differences. <laughs> so what is Seth Cook doing today? What uh, are you still playing uh, TTRPGs? You you told us early. You you still play uh, second edition, I think. I, I play I play a lot of games. I play a lot. I'm, uh, well, right now I'm actually today literally getting ready to go to a, off to a convention tomorrow, uh, um, which means I'm going to be running games and and at conventions are where I, I run most of the games I do. I do play in a couple of. I've been playing in an old school adventure game that a, a friend is running, uh, and at conventions I often run. Uh, basic and expert games because they're very simple the rules are simple and you know you've got four hours to play a game with people who've never met and worked together you know let's give you easy rules you know let's just go have fun kind of a thing um i play uh tabletop uh some tabletop board games not nearly as many as i used so i haven't found a i moved and so i haven't found a, a really strong group to play with uh and i play um miniature war games of all sorts like little you know my blurred out background is my my miniature painting station <laughs> and uh and computer games and i play and, you know been, i've been playing a lot of baldur's gate 3 right at the moment um because you know it definitely goes back to kind of the old school kind of uh games of, of the original baldur's gate in that style um So yeah, I still play games, um, and then I am retired, technically. Um, I do I do small projects every now and then, but you know, I'm, right now I'm you know focusing on the the things one's supposed to do in retirement, which I don't even know what they are. <laughs> I'm still learning. <laughs> <laughs> I have to ask, uh, what what class are you playing in Baldur's Gate Three? What what which what? Which class? I'm sorry. Which class am I playing in the? Right now, I'm playing a. Uh, oh, I'm playing a wizard in this old school uh, game, which means like, hi, I'm you know I'm second level and I have one spell, <laughs> 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 kind of thing. And so I didn't weird. die. You know, I, I I've made it to second level. That was an accomplishment right there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, what would you suggest to people that are just starting? professional careers in the TTRPG industry? Oh, uh, yeah, that's, boy, just starting in the TTR, and yeah, um, no play game, you know, the first thing is the same thing I always tell, tell everything, one, uh, anybody wants to get on the TTR, you know, you probably, you know, learn how to self-publish because, you know, you need, you, you know, there aren't, there aren't companies kind of like there used to be nearly as much that would have a staff of designers on hand. You know, uh, most of everything now is either through freelance or self-published kind of things. Um, and so, you know, you need to go do that, which means, you know, there are some important things you need to learn there, like learn how to write, <laughs> pay attention to those grammar classes and all that, those composition classes and stuff, because, you know, most of your time, and this is true even for going off and working on video games is that, The things that designers do most of all is they write and they have to write things to explain to other people about what's going on. So, you know, it's important. Um, but then, you know, once you've done that, if you're self-publishing, you know, don't don't plan on on creating your empire overnight, you know, in terms of, you know, your publishing empire, but, you know, make something that you find interesting that you think other people will like it's a lot of it's you know it's got to bear i always have to kind of remember that too will other people enjoy this um and um and then you know then then make it make something make something you like but also something but but not only you make you know we we have we used to have lots of game ideas at tsr um and that we never said we said yeah that's great we're never going to do that because You know, it's like this thing that you and I like and everybody else is going to look at and go like, what the hell? <laughs> um, and, you know, so you always, always look towards kind of like what what are people interested in and don't copy. Don't, don't, doesn't mean copy what whatever is popular at the moment, 
but it does mean you know look at what people are saying look what what's the vibe that they're kind of going for and how can i steal good ideas and and change them and and then and then work them in a way that makes them my idea um you know there's that you know that whole old kind of worn out line about you know artists steal you know good artists steal but and that is true you know you look at what other people do and you say oh i could do that but how can you do that in a way that is not just copying that other person and you know that was like a real problem with video games for a long time every every game pitch had to be diablo every or you know every game pitch is like the last thing that was most popular and the trick is how do you kind of make that that uh video game where the budgets and the stakes are really high so all the marketing people go like well we want, we know that'll sell so we want that right um how do you make something that you can convince them it's like yeah it, it's like that but not you know <laughs> and it's yeah and then how do you make that not sound like to all the people are working on like oh we're making diablo no 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 that's not the goal <laughs> so uh, i save this question for last so it's easy to edit out because we are journalists and we have to ask were you consulted for the new edition of planescape did you take any part in the development of that product uh no i did not i um uh, had a very brief early discussion um uh, i had a very brief discussion earlier this year that did not go well it did not go to my involvement and in let's put it that way um so yeah i'm a little i'm i'm less than thrilled about that i have not read it at this point because it's still new i haven't i um i've looked at some reviews uh they generally seem to be positive that makes me happy um and uh well you know at this point it is you know it is not it is i have to accept the idea that it is not the planescape that i that i created uh and then i have kind of accepted that because even after i when i left tsr a lot of other hands took over on planescape and did stuff and you just have to go like okay they're going to do stuff um i don't want to i I'm, i don't want to be the guy who sits there and goes like those those bastards they ruined my thing or whatever or anything like that because that doesn't you know what what good does that do anybody <laughs> right and so you know i'll i think i'll just try and go figure out what i want to do next well, that's what everybody is doing in life isn't it yeah. <laughs> so, Seth, thank you very much for this interview. I learned a lot. It was really, uh, I, I really learned a little bit about the behind the scenes of a part of uh, role playing history that I always wanted to learn. So, thank you so, so much. It was like Leon always says, a treat to have you here. And, uh, guys, I don't know if you want to say something. Yes, of course. Uh, it, it was amazing chatting with you. It's 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 amazing because you 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 have so so fresh like memories of everything. I, I well, don't know. I'm making this all up. <laughs> wow. <laughs> We you fooled us all. <laughs> you you had us. No, it's amazing. It's amazing chatting with you, and and we really really thank you for your time and your openness. <laughs> Oh, there are a lot of things I didn't reveal. That's, <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's okay. I, I gotta say that uh, it, it, it's it's really amazing for us to be able to talk with you because you you are such an important part of the of the, uh, the, the RPG history, and and it's so strange for us to be able to do this. We we talked before, <laughs> and, and wow, we we're talking with Seth Cook. Um, so I have to thank you for being here and for all your work. It, it really make Uh, a lot of our history really really easier like playing games that you work on on you or are you inspired to uh really make i don't know well, our channels well, easier <laughs> yeah the thing the thing though in talking with with the, all of you is that you really remind me that this this has become way beyond just you know a small little company thing that we started doing and it's and and even way beyond a a you know a us thing or even an english speaking thing or whatever that this is this is really uh you know a kind of a full on global you know global thing that i would got i somehow accidentally uh got to be part of <laughs> 
a, a happy accident. Yeah, yeah. Well, sometimes. Sometimes they do work out. 